the way things are in the world. And you know, I think many of us, we don't, and myself included, we don't really understand the fullness of what the gospel is and what Jesus has done for us. We don't really understand. We say, well, Jesus is the answer. Well, how's he the answer? I don't even know the question. What's, he's the answer for your problems. Well, that, that's, a, that's a true statement. But how is he the answer? If I say Jesus is the answer to your relational problems with your friends, to your relational problems with your family, today we're going to look at that, and you can see. And we're going to look at it through the life of one man, one of the most famous stories in the Bible. And, you know, I'm really excited about the high school and middle school. You guys doing a Joseph, what's it called, a technic, multicolored technicolor dream code, right? And nurses here with us today. Thank you so much. I love, this is going to be great. And the, um, this play in the story of Jesus, uh, of Joseph, we're going to look at, shows us how to mend relationships. So Joseph, you know the story of Joseph. If you haven't read it, guys, especially you guys who are in the play or as you go watch the play, you need to read it in the Bible because it is an incredibly exciting story. It starts in Genesis 37. It goes all through the rest of Genesis, about 13 chapters. And there's a lot of really wild things in the Bible that are kind of crazy. So it starts off. Joseph in chapter 37, he's about 17 years old. And Joseph's dad was a man named Jacob. God had um, changed his name to Israel, the same name as the country we have today. So Jacob loved Joseph more than the other brothers. There were 12 brothers by four different wives. Now that's pretty crazy. I won't go into that. I don't even think it. Two of the wives were sisters. That's really crazy, Leah and Rachel. And the father had worked, Jacob had worked for 14 years to marry Rachel. He married, worked the first seven and his father-in-law tricked him and he had to, he married their older sister, Leah. And then he had to work another 14 years. So he loved Rachel, but Rachel had a hard time having children. So when she did have children, she had Joseph and, and Benjamin. And so the father, Jacob, kind of played favorites with Jacob, which is really sad when that happens in a family. When a child feels like the parents love one child more than the other. Kids, don't worry about that. I just guarantee your parents love you all the same. So Joseph was kind of a tattletale. In the very first couple verses in 37, he tells on his brothers. saying his brothers don't like him. And then his dad makes him this coat, right? This beautiful, multicolored Technicolor, I like that word, Technicolor dream coat that he wears around. And he wears it and he's proud. And then Joseph starts having dreams. He has these crazy dreams. He sees uh, the wheat bow down and, and in front of him. And he tells his brothers, hey, I had this dream. And, and then this wheat, your wheat, bowed down to mine, to me. And then the stars and the moon bowed down. And everybody's like, enough, Joseph. We're tired of hearing you. You're bragging. We think you're the greatest. You're the you're you're your dad's pet. We we say that in America. It's kind of like the teacher's pet. So you can go ahead with the next one there. So Joseph with his father's pet, and he got everything he wanted. Well, one day, dad sent him out to see his his other brothers. He said, "Go find out what they're doing." Joseph got lost actually, and then he finally found his brothers. His brothers said, "Hey, here he comes. Let's get rid of Joseph. Let's just kill him." So they grab him, they throw him in a pit. You can go to the next one. They throw him down in this pit, and he's down there, and they're thinking, well, we shouldn't kill him. Maybe we shouldn't kill him because that's really bad. Why don't we just sell him? And these tra traders came along the way. They sold him to these uh, traders going to Egypt. He was trafficked. Isn't that terrible? He's trafficked. So his brother's say, what are we going to tell dad? They kill this animal, they get his coat, put the blood on the animal, they take it back and say, dad, looks like Joseph might have gotten eaten by some kind of wild animal. His dad's all sad and can't believe it. 
So, but Joseph was sold at, into the pit, sold into Egypt, he goes into Egypt, and there he gets sold to a man named Potiphar. And Potiphar is the captain of the king's guard. So he's like a soldier. And he likes Joseph. And for about 10 years, Joseph worked. And it says in the Bible, it says that everything Joseph did prospered. It says God was with him. And God blessed everything that Joseph did. So there, Potiphar's house, if you look back up on the balcony there, you see this woman back there getting fanned. Well, while he was in the house, Potiphar's wife said, had a crush on David. She started liking David. And she said, come with me. And Joseph said, no, your, your husband has given me control over everything in the house. I wouldn't sin against him. And she gets upset. And Joseph runs off. The woman grabs his robe. He had another robe. Joseph must have liked robes. So he grabs his robe and runs off. The wife says, you know, he came in here just to laugh at me, make fun of me. And Potiphar says, okay, Joseph. You're going to jail. So after 10 years working from, he goes from, the, uh, from being his father's pet to where? The pit to Potiphar's house. A lot of peace. Jonathan did this few weeks, so I'm staying on your feet thing there. And then, and now he goes to prison. He goes to prison. So Joseph's in prison. And then one day he, he starts helping out in the prison. He does a great job in the prison. So the prison guard says, you can be in charge of all the prisoners. He's a prisoner. He must have been a really good prisoner. And then one day, two of the king's uh, people who worked in the palace, the baker and the cupbearer, had dreams. And they didn't know what to think about the dreams. And Joseph interpreted their dreams right. And so Joseph, the two guys, went, one of the guys got his head cut off, like it said in the dream. The other guy got to go back and work as the cupbearer for the king. So Joseph stuck in prison. They forgot about him. But then a couple years later, the king, the pharaoh, has a dream. And he doesn't know what it means. And so this cupbearer says, oh, I remember. There was a guy in prison who interpreted my dream. He said, maybe he can interpret it. So Joseph goes and interprets the dream. Do you remember the dream? Do you remember what it was? He dreams that there's seven skinny cows and then seven fat cows, and the fat cows come up and eat the skinny cows. Then he has a, a seven a very full ears of corn, and then seven thin ears of corn come and eat those up. And Joseph interprets it and says, Hey, what your dream means is that there's going to be seven really good years where we're going to get a lot of food. And then we're going to get seven really bad years where there's no crops are going. There's maybe no rain. There's a famine in the land. So when the king hears this dream, he says, wow, you're incredible. He makes Joseph like the governor, kind of like the vice, like the vice pharaoh of, you can go to the next one there. So he goes from the prison to the palace. And now he's working for the pharaoh. So can you imagine? So where, where did he start off? He was his father's pet, right? Say it with me. He was, a, you can go to the next one there. Let's look at Joseph's trail. He went from being the pet to the pit to the Potiphar's house to prison. Now he's in the palace. Wow. So Joseph does a great job keeping all the grain there for, for seven years, storing it up while the crops are good. And then something, this is where the story gets really good. Because the second year, when everybody started running out of food, Joseph is listening to everybody, selling the grain to everyone. And he notices, guess who comes to visit Egypt and wants to buy some food? Does anybody know? Any of you kids know who comes to visit? His brothers. Exactly. So his brothers come, and Joseph recognizes them because he still knows Hebrew. He still knows the same language. So he hears what they're saying. He can't believe it. 
Well, Joseph plays this little game with us. He's like kind of teasing to, just to find out where their heart is. So he sends them back and he puts their money back in. They pay for it, he puts their money back in the bags of grain. They get back home and they go, oh no, he's going to think we stole it. So they go back again. And he says, oh no, you paid me. I have my silver. God must have given you that. And then he says, uh, Joseph acts like they're spies. He says, I know who you are. You're spies. You're trying to find out where we're weak as a nation during this famine. And they say, no, 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 we're not spies. I promise. We have our father lives back there. We have a younger brother who's back at home. He says, I don't believe you. Go get him and bring him back. So he keeps one of the brothers there in Egypt. And then they go, they go back to get their younger brother. They bring him in. And Joseph treats him to a big face. Big face and gives Benjamin, who's his real brother by the same mother, he gives him the most food, he treats him really good, and then he sends him off on their way with a cup in Benjamin's back. Benjamin is his father's next favorite son. So when they get, they get brought back to Joseph, they look through the bags and they find this cup that Joseph has put in their bag and they go, oh no! Oh no, our youngest brother had this cup in there. So the older brother said, no, just let me stay here. Let me take the punishment. Our father's going to die if, if he knows his other younger son is, our, our youngest brother is going to be taken and held in prison, in prison. So they keep on there, just can't believe what's happened. And then Joseph can't stand it anymore. Joseph starts crying. He sends all the other Egyptians out of the room, and he goes, it's me. I'm your brother, Joseph, that you sent off to Egypt so many years ago. What do you think those brothers thought? Can you imagine being there when he says, it's me, and he says, come, and he wants to hug them, and they're like, oh, is he going to kill us? What's he going to do? It's an incredible story. But Joseph says, no, get your father, bring everybody here, and he forgives them. Think about it. Joseph went to the pit. He went to the prison. He, he had all these things. He was trafficked. He had been away from his family 22 years at this point. They say he was 39 years old when his brothers came to figure out. He left when he was 17. 39 years old, he finally sees his brothers. So how does Joseph welcome his brothers back? And this is what I want you to get in the musical that you're working on. This is, this is an incredible story. Because what Joseph says to his brothers is unbelievable. How does Joseph welcome them? He should be mad at them. You should want revenge, right? I'm going to pay you back what you did for me. Go to the next slide here. There's a few things that Joseph says in chapter 45 when he meets him. The first thing he says to him, go ahead and click the next one there, man. The next two, he says, God sent me ahead of you. God sent me ahead of you. How did God send him ahead of you? Then his brothers sell him. His brothers sold him into slavery, right? So how was he able to say that God sent Joseph ahead to save him? He said that God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. Now, this is incredible that he saw his situation from this perspective. And if you go over later, uh, Jacob comes and lives in Egypt. The whole family comes and he takes care of them for many years. And then one day Jacob dies. Well, you know what the brothers think then? Now that dad's gone, he's going to kill us for sure. He's been waiting for dad to go away. And then he's going to punish us. So the brothers come up to him and they say, please, we're, we'll be your servants. Please forgive us. We know what we did. We're so sorry. And Joseph says, again, what he believed, which allowed him to 
be reconciled or joined together with his brothers. Again, he says, you can press on this one, he says, am I in the place of God? Am I in the, in the place of God? Now, if young people today, I don't know if you other parents have experienced this, there's a big thing about not judging people today, right? Have y'all heard that in your homes? You know, well, we, we don't need to judge them because they are this or that. We don't need to judge people. And Joseph saw himself the same way. He said, am I the judge? Am I the one that's going to judge you for what you did to me? Am I God? Am I going to put myself in God's place? Now, I do believe God wants us to, to discern what's right and what's wrong. But to judge someone, to repay them, to get revenge, God says, vengeance is mine. He will pay people back. We don't have to worry about that. We shouldn't even think about paying people back. And then the next thing Joseph says, he says, what you meant for evil against me, God meant it for good. God meant it for good. Going to the pit, God meant it for good. Going to prison, being away from his family for 20 years, having to learn a new language, all these different things that Joseph faced. He said, what well, you meant, your brothers of mine meant for evil. God meant it for good. Now, what can we learn from this? What is this all about? Is it just about Joseph? Is it just about Joseph, what we see here? Because God is telling us something more than just about Joseph's life in this, in this story. Because go ahead to the next one again. God was showing us in Joseph's life. He was telling us about something, someone that he would send to us in the future. Not just to reconcile us like this with each other, but to reconcile us to God, to make us have a relationship, a loving relationship with God. Because where Joseph was the beloved son of his father, Jesus was also the beloved son, the only son of God the Father. Where, where G Joseph was sold by his brothers for 20 pieces of silver, Jesus was sold by someone close to him, Judas, for 30 pieces of silver. So, while Joseph was faithful in temptation and not giving in to Potiphar's wife, Jesus also resisted temptation. Joseph was accused falsely, right, by Potiphar's wife. He was accused. Jesus was even accused of even something more false. Joseph was thrown in prison. Jesus, before they crucified him, they threw him in prison while they were considering what to do with him. While Joseph was humiliated, he was trafficked. Human trafficking, which we all know today is like one of the worst things that could happen to a person. Jesus was humiliated, stripped of his clothes and crucified. But he didn't just endure it and endure suffering. Jesus endured unto death. Just like Joseph, after he went down into the pit in the prison, God exalted him into the palace. Even more so, Jesus, after he was crucified and died on the cross, he rose from the dead and he's now seated with God in heaven. He was exalted. Just as Joseph reconciled himself to his brothers, Jesus did the same thing for us. He reconciled us, restored our relationship with us, and forgave us for our sins, just like Joseph said. In the last one, Jesus saved those who sinned against him. Right? The whole family, Jacob's whole family, would have died from in the famine. But Joseph saved them all by, as what God had done for me, by absorbing the pain. Now, kids, when someone hurts your feelings, when someone hurts you physically, maybe, you feel like they owe you something, right? Adults too, right? 
If somebody hurts your feelings, they say something, they do something, you feel like there's a debt. They owe me something. They hurt my feelings. They owe me. They either owe me an apology or maybe they need to pay something back to me. But there's a debt right there that needs to be paid. What we see in Joseph is an example of what Jesus did for us today. And then in 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5, it says, God has given us the ministry and the message of reconciliation so that we can also forgive others who hurt us. And how do we do that? Well, we have to die. When I say die, maybe not physically, but somebody has got to pay that debt, right? Somebody hurts you and they owe you, somebody's got to pay it back. And so what God is asking us to do is to absorb that pain, just like Jesus did. And the reason we can do it, the reason we can take that pain, is because God's Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus, is living in us. And he has forgiven us for more than we could ever do against anyone else, or more than anyone else has ever done against us. So God empowers us by his spirit to say, you know, am I in the place of God? Because that's what we're doing when we want to pay someone back. You owe me. You owe me an apology. You owe me something. And sometimes, you know, Joseph's brothers came back and gave him an apology. They said, we're sorry. Forgive us, which is great. But sometimes people don't. That's when it's really hard. But God wants us to say, it's okay. I'm not God. And what you meant for evil in my life. Listen to this, kids, and everybody. This is the most important thing. I don't know what's been done to you in your life. I want you to think about some of the worst things that's ever been done to you. Or maybe something right now that you're hurting. That you're hurting if someone hurt your feelings. What that person meant for good meant for evil, but that person meant for evil in you. If you give it to God, he will make it for good in your life, just like he did Jesus. Isn't that incredible? That's the good news of the gospel, that no matter what has happened to you, I don't care if you've been abused, beaten, rejected, Jesus says, I have accepted you now. Not only do I just justify you, make it right, your sin, I'm not just going to justify you and say, okay, you're, you're forgiven. I'm going to accept you into my family because justification is just legal. Reconciliation is personal. And God loves you more than you could ever imagine. And because he has forgiven you and me, now we have this storehouse of love and forgiveness in our hearts as we think about what we have done to Jesus. That we're now able to say, it's okay. It's okay. I'm not, that, I'm not God. And what that person meant for bad in my, my life, God is going to use it for good. So what are you hurting with today? What's, what person is hurting you? This is one of the most incredible promises that God has reconciled us. Go to the very next slide here, the last one. I love this verse. It says, for if, while we were God's enemies, when we, you were an enemy, before you were a Christian, God reconciled us to him through the death of Jesus. Okay. If while we were enemies, he reconciled us, how much more now that we are his children, will we be saved from sin by his life? That is the message of the gospel. That is really the story of Joseph and his multicolored dream. So kids, as you guys, you, if you're 
working on this play. Remember, you're probably going to get hurt, your feelings hurt. You're probably going to hurt someone else's feelings. Be quick to apologize. Accept forgiveness, receive forgiveness. But you, you might be thinking, well, what if, what if I've done something to someone else? Well, look at Joseph's brother, brothers. They, God turned it into good for even his brothers, the one who did the evil things. Because sometimes we do bad things, right? So whether you're the receiver of the evil or the hurt or the one who does it, if you go to God and say, God, I'm sorry, forgive me, God will turn that around for your good, for the good of your relationships. So would you bow your head just a moment? As we close, I'll ask the worship team to come up. We're going to sing one song. I want you to think of whatever it is that's still hurting your heart today. Maybe someone has hurt you. Maybe someone has said something mean to you. Maybe there's a friend that you feel like you, you can't be a friend with them anymore. Because what Jesus has done for us, because he has reconciled himself to us, we now can be reconciled, first of all, with him. And that's the most important thing. If you've not been reconciled to God today, today is the day for that as well. That you could say in your heart, God, I'm sorry that I've sinned. I've hurt you. Forgive me for my sin." come into my heart. That's the first step. And as you do that, and God will fill your heart with his love, with his forgiveness, and peace. That's what reconciliation is. It's peace. Peace with God and peace with other people. God, we thank you for your forgiveness. We thank you that you have reconciled us to yourself by the death of your son, your beloved son. We thank you for this story of Joseph that shows for us what you had planned before creation to send your son to absorb the punishment for our sin so that we could be reconciled to you. So God, I pray your blessing on each person here. We've all been hurt. But God, we're not you. And we trust you. That vengeance is yours. That forgiveness is yours. And so we step off of this judgment seat toward others who have hurt us. We ask you to make this truth, this incredible gift of reconciliation real in our lives that we can be re reconciled with others. And God, thank you that you just didn't forgive us, but you invited us to be your children. And now we call you our Father. Thank you that you have reconciled yourself to us and made us your children. In Jesus' name, amen.